Welcome to Counter Apologetics. I'm your host, Emerson Green. So, I've long held that eternal conscious torment creates internal problems for Christianity and any other form of theism that affirms it, and I no longer believe it's possible to overcome those problems. So, consider this proposition A perfectly good, loving, just, and merciful being superintends the eternal conscious torment of humans. That is an incoherent proposition. It's not an emotional issue. It's literally just incoherent. You might as well say, the square circle sleeps you very orangely. I tried to use the slightly more passive word superintend to avoid objections about sending yourself to hell and the like, so I'm not claiming that God sends people to hell, only that he oversees the process. He is responsible for the creation and management of whatever processes take place after death. It's not as if God just found the afterlife sorting system in place after popping into existence himself and thought, well, I guess I'm stuck with this. He created heaven. He created hell. He created the rules according to which souls are sorted into one or the other. If there is such a thing as eternal conscious torment, it's because God created the world to be that way. So back to my claim that that proposition is just incoherent. A perfectly loving God superintends the eternal conscious torment of human beings. So, is there any logical conflict at all between being perfectly loving and superintending the eternal Eternal. torment torment of conscious beings that he created? This is a rhetorical question. I have absolutely no idea what being loving is means if it's compatible with superintending the torture of conscious creatures for trillions upon trillions of years. If you think that proposition makes any sense, then one of two things is going on. Either the notion of loving bears literally no relation to what anyone has ever meant by loving, or you have a very different idea of what eternal conscious torment entails. I'm imagining the lake of fire, a place of anguish and severe pain, So again, at least one of the words in that proposition needs to mean something completely different from what any person ordinarily means in order to render it coherent. Not plausible or likely, just not logically contradictory. I can imagine a theist pushing back and saying, so God's not conforming to your idea of those terms. How dare you subject God to your human standards of goodness, love, justice, and mercy? No, not just my idea of what those words mean. It's what I mean, what you mean, what every person means. We don't need a perfect, agreed-upon conceptual analysis of those ideas. If they mean anything in the ballpark of how we ordinarily use them, the conflict with facilitating eternal torture is blindingly obvious. The proposition, a perfectly good, merciful, just, and loving God, superintends the eternal conscious torment of human beings, which a believer in eternal conscious torment must defend, is incoherent simply in virtue of the meaning of those words. You have to just take a word in that proposition and say, this doesn't mean what anyone has ever meant by this, and that's how this is a coherent proposition. Scripture affirms that God is good, loving, just, and merciful. It doesn't help to say that our terms are nothing like God's notion of those terms. Yes, if God exists, he probably has a better understanding of those than sinful human beings. But surely the point of such passages in Scripture is to help us understand what God is like. Why on earth would the Bible describe God in this way if it was totally misleading? If God turned out to be nothing like our understanding of those concepts, then those passages of Scripture are inaccurate and deceptive. So, it's of no help to the defender of eternal conscious torment to claim that our understanding of justice, mercy, goodness, and love is so flawed, because of our finite, broken nature, that we're incapable of judging anything God is said to do to be incompatible with love, goodness, justice, and mercy. So, since eternal conscious torment leads to conflicts with non-negotiable aspects of theism, and since eternal conscious torment is not itself a non-negotiable aspect of theism, theists should not believe eternal conscious torment. 
I think those of us who have been steeped in Christian culture from birth can lose sight of the fact that hell is the most morally insane idea that's ever been conceived in human history. Eternal torture. No escape, no mercy. Torment for an infinite amount of time. Though you have to admit it's pretty funny that people in the 21st century are earnestly trying to defend the sadistic fantasies of a handful of downtrodden believers who lived a couple thousand years ago. Nevertheless, eternal conscious torment is a part of Christianity. There's no pretending it isn't. So if Christianity is true, then the odds of eternal conscious torment rise along with it. The problem is that eternal conscious torment is a liability. For one, it is straightforwardly incompatible with the idea of a loving God. If God's loving nature is essential to the religion, then something's got to give. Granting the truth of Christianity, eternal conscious torment clearly stands a chance of also being true, just on historical and biblical grounds. Yet it's in conflict with essential Christian teachings, namely that God is loving and morally good. Again, unless those words bear literally no relation to what I think they mean, superintending the eternal torture of conscious creatures is not something that even a morally average being could do, let alone a morally perfect being. The same goes for a perfectly loving being. God is also alleged to be just. The punishment should fit the crime is widely considered to be a just principle. Proportionality is a component of justice. It would be unjust to dole out punishment that wildly exceeded the severity of the crime. If the state had you drawn and quartered for shoplifting a cheap pen, I think it's safe to say that would be unjust. So how much greater would the injustice be to have a single human being suffer infinitely for finite crimes? There is no finite crime for which the punishment should be infinite anything, let alone infinite torture. So creating and overseeing the eternal conscious torment of humans is straightforwardly incompatible with God's just nature. God is also said to be merciful, but continual punishment that never ends is the least merciful punishment that it is possible to conceive. So either God is not merciful, or eternal conscious torment is out. In brief, eternal conscious torment is in conflict with God's merciful nature, his just nature, his loving nature, and his moral nature. The fact that eternal conscious torment is traditionally a part of Christianity is not my problem, it's a problem for Christians who want a coherent worldview. I would have to ask believers whether they consider eternal conscious torment to be a more foundational doctrine than God's nature as a good, loving, just, and merciful being. When two things that both seem true come into conflict, the one that's more certain and less negotiable should win out, right? Surely God's attributes just listed are more certain for theists than the notion of eternal conscious torment. Those attributes of God are core aspects of theism. Eternal conscious torment is not. Since they're in conflict, eternal conscious torment should lose that conflict. So here's another brief argument against eternal conscious torment. Premise 1. If God superintends the eternal conscious torment of human beings, he is worse than Hitler. Premise 2. God is not worse than Hitler. Therefore, God does not superintend the eternal conscious torment of human beings. So which are you more certain of as a Christian? That eternal conscious torment is a thing? Or that God is not worse than Hitler? They can't both be true. Of course, there's more to say about the compounding absurdity of hell like the fact that unbelief is one of the crimes that can land you in a state of eternal torture, most Christians believe that atheists cannot get into heaven. In addition to how morally bizarre it is to punish someone simply for failing to accept a few propositions, consider how shamelessly coercive it is. Even if I could choose my beliefs at will, coercion is still coercion. 
In fact, hell precludes the possibility of a free choice. It's a trivial point that we're unable to make a free choice in any meaningful sense if we're under the threat of torture. But God has no good options when it comes to granting us knowledge of hell. He's painted himself into a corner. A great wrong would be committed by withholding this consequential information, but if we do know about hell, we have a gun to our head and are no longer making meaningfully free choices. Why would God put himself in this situation? Further compounding the absurdity is that so many Christians insist on saying that you send yourself to hell, as if any sane person would will themselves to be tortured for all eternity. And why can't we be saved in the afterlife, after we have more and better information? What kind of being would even create hell, and create these rules that land people there? Why does hell have to exist at all? Some suffering on earth is justified because it serves a higher purpose, it's a means to some greater good. But the suffering in hell isn't serving any higher purpose or leading to any greater good. When I was a Christian, I had a bit of a different attitude about hell. I just accepted it as a fact of life. It seemed like asking why Venus had to exist. I was a lot more concerned with the scriptural justification of hell, more so than any other kind of justification. And this is the problem a lot of Christians will have with any rejection of eternal conscious torment. The Bible does seem to leave one thinking that the lake of fire awaits unbelievers. Well, too bad for Christianity. Eternal conscious torment is a liability, so if it is scriptural, then that counts against Christianity, since it seems unlikely that a false teaching would make it into the holy text. I'm not disagreeing with Christians who argue that hell is biblical, but if they're right, that's really bad news for Christianity. If eternal conscious torment really is biblical, then that leaves the plausibility of Christianity in pretty bad shape. In fairness to Christianity, it's pretty implausible to claim eternal conscious torment as an essential Christian doctrine. Is it really the case that there's no way Christianity could be true without it? Seems unlikely. And besides, not every Christian believes in eternal conscious torment. From the start, there have been Christians and Christian authorities who did not accept this view. That continues into the present. Within certain Christian subgroups, It's just beyond the pale to question hell as eternal conscious torment. You might as well be an atheist at that point. You're certainly not a real Christian. But the fact that their worldview is theologically and historically inaccurate, not to mention internally incoherent, is not my problem. When I think about the proposition, a perfectly loving, moral, just, and merciful God superintends the eternal conscious torment of human beings, which is what a defender of eternal conscious torment must believe, I can only feel in awe of the human capacity to believe incoherent and immoral things while remaining an otherwise intelligent and morally decent person. The longer I'm away from Christianity, the more I feel it. And some atheists are still afraid of hell. Fear, to a great extent, is instinctual and involuntary. That's often what makes it advantageous. Fear is a powerful motivator that can aid your survival. Gavin De Becker wrote an interesting book called The Gift of Fear that explains how this involuntary emotion so often guides us in our daily lives, keeping us safe and sound in a wide variety of circumstances. I'm fortunate enough not to suffer from any fear of hell, but I sympathize with those unbelievers and believers who do suffer, continuing to live in fear as a result of their early indoctrination, most likely. The fact is that if God exists, and is anything like what theists have traditionally said he's like, there is nothing to be afraid of. Strange as it may sound, eternal conscious torment is incompatible with theism. Plus, if God doesn't exist, there's no reason to worry about any of this. And you're in luck. God probably doesn't exist. In any event, I'm not afraid of burning in hell, not only for the multiple reasons I've laid out so far, 
but also because it clearly bears the stamp of our lowly origin. Hell is a transparently man-made concept. Really, we're just arguing over these sadistic fantasies of a subset of downtrodden early Christians. Whether atheists or theists are right, there's no reason to be afraid of eternal conscious torment. Either God doesn't exist and there isn't anything to worry about, or God exists and we shouldn't worry about eternal conscious torment because the God of theism exists. If God's nature is anything like theists have traditionally affirmed, good, merciful, just, and loving, eternal conscious torment is not a feature of the world. So if God is anything like theists have traditionally said he's like, eternal conscious torment is nothing to be afraid of. Thank you for listening. I've been Emerson Green, and I'll talk to you next time.